Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks, Eric, for uh, being able to switch uh, slots um, so that uh, my co co-author, co-developer, uh, Wojciech, uh, can still be here in the audience. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, an open source project or a couple of open source projects uh, related to smart cards that um, I've been involved in for the past, I don't know, six years, two years, something like that. Um, and I'll, I'll try and discuss some, some of the uh, technical uh, aspects and also some of the project um, procedural aspects uh, that we've, um, that we've um, encountered over the years. So um, I'm Martijn Oostek. I work as an advisor here in Enschede at Nove. Does anybody know Nove here? No. They were used to, to be called the Telematica Institute. Oh, yeah. So I mean, we, were, we used to be on the campus of the, um, of the University of Santa. Um, we're now located near to the uh, Holz Festival. Um, yeah. Could you speak louder? Yeah, of course. Okay. Um, my colleague, uh, Wojciech Mostowski, former colleague, um, he's working at the University of Twente at this point. Um, we share a history uh, in smart card related projects uh, when we were working together in Nijmegen a long time ago in a group of Bart Jacobs, um, so that's the University of Nijmegen. Um, as a result of some of the projects that we did there, we uh, started some open source projects, and that's what I'm talking about today. That's the biggest, at least in terms of lines of code, is um, JMRTD. M MRTD stands for Machine Readable Travel Documents or Passports. Um, as you may know, all passports issued today contain um, uh, uh, an IC chip um, with some uh, passport holder data and also some cryptographic functionality. Um, the specifications are, are open, so you can try to talk to this chip, and uh, that's exactly what we do in this project. We also emulate this chip, so we have a, a, a smart card implementation in Java Card. I'll explain Java Card in more detail in the next couple of slides. Um, there are some other projects sort of related or um, based on the same code base. Uh, GPJ is one uh, which is about um, you know, card management, uh, how you uh, load applications onto a smart card running Java Card or in fact any other operating system. Um, there's the uh, electronic driver's license standard, which was also implemented by Wojciech. Um, and there's a project where, where uh, we have a um, cryptographic signing applet in Java. Anyway, I, I, I will focus on JMRTD. That's the impossible. Are these all Dutch or European standards? or? So the e-passport standard is international. It's um, the international international civic aviation organization that uh, publishes it. And this is uh, part of the United Nations, which is a, which is a bit strange, right? Well, I don't know if it's strange, but it's a uh, it's, it's a body within the United Nations which uh, issues these uh, standards. Um, Global Platform used to be an initiative by Visa, I think, or is that yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but it's now an open organization. It's a consortium of many smart card related uh, companies all over the world. Um, and the driver's license is, uh, is an ISO standard. Now. I think the PKI applet is also an ISO standard based on yeah. maybe RSA. Um, I don't remember the number. There is a number. So chances are that you have a smart card on you. In fact, I would guess perhaps as much as three smart cards, because your banking card will, uh, will be a smart card, contains a chip these days, and your SIM card is within your mobile phone, will be a smart card. And if you have a passport uh, or identity card in your Dutch, um, it will contain a chip. Um, and you're supposed to carry ID in the network, right? So the driver's license doesn't have a chip at this point, but uh, your uh, a public transport card or a chip card uh, will be a smart card. Maybe you have an access control card for your building or where you work. Um, maybe you, you probably don't have this one on you, but if you have a cable or a satellite decoder, that will contain a smart card. The thing I'm trying to say is um, they're everywhere. So these are really, really small computers, really. And 
they're everywhere. It's a very simple computer and it's designed for security. It's not designed for, definitely not for running uh, X Windows, um, not even a uh, command prompt. They can't run Linux. Um, they have a much simpler operating system on them. Um, and they basically have very, very simplistic uh, input outputs. So there's an ISO standard for that. Basically, you send a packet in and you get a packet in response. So it's um, half duplex, sort of, it looks like um, like serial, but the old you know, R232. Uh, uh, What's special is that even though they contain a very simple processor, a very simple CPU, they usually have a coprocessor that's pretty fast in doing cryptographic operations. So RSA, DES, all of the, all of the open sort of, um, standard algorithms. Sometimes, in the case of the Apple chip card, they have a proprietary algorithm, which is not a good idea. I don't guess I don't have to explain that to you. Um, um, and and what's the other thing that's special about it, make, making smart cards more secure than a normal computer, is that there are intentional uh, mechanisms for trying to secure whatever is stored in it. Like credentials, keys. So there are active countermeasures for known attacks. Noise reduction, noise generation, generation. There's dual rail logic. There's an active grid which looks whether you know somebody is trying to open the chip, and, and it will actively try to erase memory uh, at that point. On all sorts of different layers, there are security mechanisms that work in smart cards as soon as you power them on. Power them on. Um, there are different types of smart cards, of course. Uh, this OP chip card, my fair classic, is really just a file system with some access control on it based on cryptographic, uh, based on challenge response. But the sort of smart cards that we're interested in, I guess, um, are more the fully programmable microcontroller type cards. And Java card is a standard for programming them. Um, I told you that your passport and your, in the Netherlands, your OP chip card are smart cards. Normally you can recognize a complex smart card by those contact pads. So your EMP banking card will be like that. Um, these days contactless cards are more popular for certain purposes. Um, the reason to choose for contactless can be very low tech. Like in the passport, you can't put a passport in a reader just because it's a booklet. Okay, so it makes more sense to make it a contactless chip than this one. Um, for public transport, of course, uh, you use contactless because you don't want people standing in line, inser inserting them and uh, uh, retrieving their smart card from a, from a contact reader. You just want them to hold the thing against the reader and then move on. And the whole purpose is to speed up the, the queues uh, uh, at the entrance of uh, public transport uh, facilities. Anyway, bus. Is that, is that a standardized structure, the, the contact structure? Basically, what is standard, what is standardized on a couple of different levels is um, the interface, and there's some quality criteria from which you can derive that you need an antenna that is at least this big. Uh, what, what you see there is the, uh, the the chip is embedded within the card, and then they use an antenna for um, basically for induction. So you hold it against the reader. The antenna is just a coil. Um, the reader is also a coil, you send a current through it, and then induction happens, so a current starts to run in this coil, and that powers up the chip, and that is also the communication channel. So by modulating that power signal, you can communicate with the chip. Um, if you have a contact smart card, um, there, there's a, there are some different contact points. One is for power, uh, PPD, uh, PCC, I'm not even sure, PCC I guess. It used to be in the old days, you needed VPP to program the card, so you needed the higher current for that. Um, notice also that there's a clock signal there. So the computer within the smart card is so simple that it doesn't even have a crystal to. to um, you know, you need, the clock signal is external to the smart card itself. Hmm. Every input or output channel on a smart card is a potential attack vector, of course, right? So modern smart cards, contact smart cards, will have their own internal clock. Um, to, to, to be compliant with the old standards, they accept the clock signal, but of course they don't trust it, 
right? Every channel is potentially dangerous. So let's talk about Java Guard. Um, when we worked in Manmaker, which and, my, and myself, um, we were involved in a, uh, a project on Java Guard. We were interested in this standard um, precisely because we were interested in semantics of programming languages. Java is pretty well documented for a programming language that is actually used. Um, and Java Guard is really just a smaller version of Java. You could say it's, it's, it's a language, it is. Um, just like normal Java, it's also a platform, it's a virtual machine. Uh, I've done on top of an operating system or hardware uh, in case of smart control. You have a Java card virtual machine, which is slightly different from the normal Java virtual machine. It's smaller, basically. And there's an API with some um, software that you can call. Well, software, there's an API that for example, the cryptographic processor is, is being um, accessed through an API. So I'll get back to this. On the left, you see the input output channel. Um, you send in an APDU, which stands for Application Programming Data Unit. Protocol Data. Again? Application Protocol Data Unit. Application Protocol Data Unit. Sorry. It's a byte array. And there's command and response versions of those. Basically just strings of bytes that you send in and that you retrieve out. So you send in a command, the smart card does some processing, and it gives you an answer within a certain time limits specified in this ISO specification. So what's the difference between Java and Java card? Java card is, um, well, just like Java is a higher level of, it gives you a higher level of abstraction when compared to programming uh, uh, smart cards directly in, uh, in their native um, uh, processor language um, is published in, uh, as a standard. So the, basically the, the language itself is just Java. So the Java language specification holds for that. But the virtual machine is slightly different. Um, so there's a, a, a specific Java card virtual machine. So notice the, notice the C there. Um, you can run multiple applications on a single card, which in 2002 at least was very revolutionary. Um, before that, smart cards were very application specific, but they were thinking of you know, the future where you might have your passport, um, and maybe your driver's license, and some, some other applications, loyalty schemes perhaps, uh, on a single smart card. That hasn't happened by the way. So, but it's still good to know that you can put multiple applications on a smart card. Plus, did, did you say loyalty schemes? Yeah, so, so, so think for example of your um, a payment card where you also put your Albert Heijn bonus card on the same card. So mm -hmm. every time you pay with it, you don't have to give them another card. Yeah. Yeah. For example, yesterday I was at the Plus Market and they now offer people their own scanner readers. Yeah. And I also thought nowadays everyone has a smartphone, so why not just... Uh, yeah. Do it by smartphone. Yeah, I think that will be the next step. Yeah. yeah. Maybe because, well, you don't want to exclude people without a smartphone. But yeah, but then you can have to. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that will be the next step. So. Okay, so the virtual machine is a bit simpler. So uh, you use 16 bit arithmetic. Normally in Java, the default is int, which is 32 bit. The API is much simpler, there are no floating points, no doubles, no strings, there really it's much, much more limited. Um, if you look at the Java card program at the source, you don't use the, the usual inheritance and other higher level abstraction mechanisms uh, available in Java. But it's nice to just have a sort of standardized language. Okay? So when you program Java card, you use the normal tool sets available to Java programmers. So you can use your Eclipse IDE or whatever IDE you prefer um, to do this. Only after you compile your only after you compile your uh, program to class to to bytecode, um, it will be converted to a, a format that's uh, that's being able to run off a smart card. The API also offers some things that are not available in the standard Java API, such as a transaction mechanism. You can imagine if you have a, 
typical smart card use case, you need to do something like check into your uh, bus or train, and then if you interrupt that transaction at some point, you want to be able to roll it back. So that's sort of native in the API that's available as part of the language. Um, there's a firewall precisely for the use case where you need to do loyalty kind of schemes um, together with um, like a payment application, and you want to separate those apps. You want to give a limited interface between two applets. Normally, applets are completely separated through this firewall. Um, and there's, of course, a, a crypto API, uh, which directly gives you access to the crypto process. Um, while we were working on, on this project, project the uh, idea was that Java card would soon take over the world. I'm not actually sure that has happened. Um, a lot of SIM cards are Java card these days, EMV cards tend to be Java cards, um, but there are also, I mean, there, there are still Multos still around, there are proprietary um, uh, operating systems there. So if I may, there's plenty yeah. of Java card um, cards out there. Uh, what they try to do is they try to push the version in and what comes into Java card quite a lot, but that, that, that didn't catch up at all. So now they have the version 3.0 that is even supposed to run on current uh, web servers on the smart card and all this, uh, but nobody seems to uh, yeah. be wanting to use it. So as it was sort of established in around 2000, this the standard, they just fixed it. What, what you still find is basically the standard from 2000 is slightly corrected and fixed, and that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. that's what's new. So they started adding a remote procedure calls on, on top of the APDU mechanism. This is officially dead now. No, that hasn't caught on. So I think 3.0, the sort of, you have sort of web server within your smart card. That also hasn't caught on. Um, all of the specifications like ePassport, EMV, are still you know, written for APDUs. Um, and um, and they, they, of course, leave the choice for operating system open in those specifications. Some of them are sort of geared towards Java card. But I, I don't. I don't think, well, it, it hasn't happened uh, the way that we thought in, in 2000. Let me say something about Passport Stand. Um, so this was uh, an article in the Telegraaf some time ago, uh, where Bart Jacobs, so my former boss, um, and um, some other security experts uh, were um, saying that the passport might some security problems. Um, you see a lot of these um, sort of, I, I would say, sometimes a bit sensational uh, articles um, in, in the press. Um, and sometimes they have a point and sometimes they don't have a point. This one doesn't, uh, in, in my opinion at least. And the funny thing is that uh, this security researcher here is showing his passport and there's a, a security mechanism in the passport where you need to have access to these two lines here, the machine readable zone and they contain some information from which you can derive a key, an access key, to actually you know, get, get the permission to talk to the, to the chip. If you don't have optical access to the inside of your passport, um, you, um, you can't talk to the chip. It will refuse to, to talk to you. So if you want to somehow read the chip, you really have to physically hold it to a, uh, yeah. to a reader? Yes. Okay. So in uh, Schiphol, you need to pass through those um, access gates. You will hold your passport with the holder page open to a um, to an OCR reader, and that will read the, the two uh, machine readable line zones, machine readable zone lines, uh, and based on your date of birth, the, the date of expiry of the document, and the document number, it takes a hash of, the, of those values, and that will give you a, a triple desk key that gives you access to the. So the usual practice of copying passports is very unsafe now. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's why they uh, they advised shortly ago uh, not to let people do that anymore. I, I don't think this is the only reason, because also your social fiscal number, your VSN, uh, is, mm -hmm. is also plainly readable, um, both in the machine readable zone and um, and on, on the holder page itself. Um, and I, I think that's that may be a problem. But in, in general, um, you know, it, it, in general, copying your passport is um, is a bad idea. Okay. But the, the funny thing is that 
the security expert here is, is complaining about secure, uh, you know, about, about the specs, about um, um, this, this thing being uh, not safe, but he's shown his access key here. Uh, if you zoom, <laughs> zoom in on his picture and you do some error checking, there, there are some redundant digits in the machine middle zone, and you can make out um, the access key for his passport. <laughs> so, so it is unsafe for him. Um, okay. I, I think actually machine re um, machine readable travel documents or uh, putting a chip or at least putting crypto cryptography into travel documents is a good idea. Um, so why is, um, in my opinion, is this a good idea? Well, there are lots of sort of authenticity marks within your passport. There's a watermark. Um, there is, um, you know, this kinogram thing if you. If you hold your passport towards the light, there's really, really micro dots in there, or small uh, holes. And if you hold it against light, um, you will see your photo. Um, and there's even some uh, variation in the angle uh, at which you see. Um, there's this poly polycarbonate holder page. This is plastic. So they've made it for an attacker much harder to duplicate a passport or to create a passport. It's very hard to create an, a passport, let's say, before 2000, around 2004 passports are somewhere here at this point. So, so we're in 2004 over there, right? Um, so at that point, it's, it's cheaper to steal someone's passport and find someone that looks like the person in the picture and get them across the border than it is to fabricate a passport yourself. Maybe some um, evil government uh, could, could copy or could create uh, a passport that looks like a Dutch passport or a, a, a US passport, but your average run of the mill criminal couldn't, right? It's, um, so it's, and, and at that point, they were afraid of lookalike fraud. Um, people, you know, I don't know, um, drugs traffickers would have a database of people, they would steal a passport, look for whoever looks. Uh, most like the person in, in the passport, um, and that would be the agent that crosses the border even. Um, so what do you do next? Well, I think this, so this is my El Gore slide, by the way. Let's see how, how, how far I can go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, so adding cryptography, adding a, a, a digital signature, <laughs> makes it impossible to create a Dutch a passport that, that would uh, run as a, uh, a, a real Dutch passport. You cannot, unless you break RSA for the... Or leak the key. Or, or if you have an insider <laughs> at, um, at the Dutch uh, printing uh, facility, of course. But at least you've done, technically, you've done the most that you can do to protect a document against you know, fabrication of... Uh, of um, uh, you, you cannot create illegal documents. Why does the polycarbonate holder page make it so hard? It's, it's a, I mean, you know, in the very beginning you could just, if you have a, had a booklet, yeah. if you had a typewriter, you could copy a passport. Say. Yeah. If you needed to. And, um, creating um, a polycarbonate holder page with all those features, like the, the, the tiny holes. Oh, okay. There are some. Yeah, it's the complete whole of it. It's, it's very only that it's polycarbonate. Right, right, right. But can, it's pretty expensive to create passport. Can it's it expensive. Be, sorry, can, yeah. can, can't it be done with uh, 3D printers? Of no? course, yeah, yeah. If you have enough money, you can do it. But I would you, go for the laser. Uh, <laughs> laser <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. If you, so what I'm trying to say is, up to this point, if you had enough money, you could fabricate authentic looking Dutch passport. So I've seen, uh, the, I've seen actually, uh, there is a company in Poland that produces those machines for printing passports for governments uh, all over Europe and all over the world. But you mean 3D printing? No, 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 the, the, the machine for personalizing okay. passports. Um, mm -hmm. That's sort of the length of this room, more or less. And uh, one piece costs around 1 million euros. So if you can spend out 1 million euros and uh, print a Dutch passport. So of course they won't sell it to you anyhow because we don't have the credentials. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, really. It's a, it's a military, uh, right. uh, military. Um, can anyone buy it, or you? Have yeah. To be do, do you have to be a government company? <laughs> um, there is definitely some screening going on, but don't ask me. 
So you, uh, you need to uh, give them a copy of your passport and they'll send no. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I remember that some years ago at least, y you could simply buy uh, card scanners and, and writers and then you could rewrite your SIM card, your uh, television card and I was always, it, won it, it wondered me that it, 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 you could simply do that. Yeah. Uh, more recently, the OP chip card. Yeah, yeah, for example. Well, well, you're not supposed to, do, to be able to do that. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but you could buy it legally. Uh, but but uh, I also have to admit, for this is an arms race, right? You can retrieve yeah. a cryptographic key from a smart card if, you, if you're good enough. If you, I mean, you can't break cryptography. At, at least you would have something other to do than, than copying passports. So <coughs> if, if you break RSA, the crypto itself, but the keys are stored somewhere in this small computer, in this smart card, right? There are ways to get them out, but they make it as difficult as possible. It's an arms race. Um, and um, my pair was easy. I, I think the processor in, in passports these days is a bit harder, but there will, become, there will come a time when um, uh, criminals or hackers are able to, to break this. You have to be realistic about this. But, but they make it as difficult, as, and I think it's a big step that they, they took. If you go from a, non, a, a passport without a chip to a passport with a chip, or with crypto, I have to say, because um, basically we're talking yeah. just about signing here, just a cryptographic signature over the contents. Um, you can do that very low tech. You can put a QR code in there if it could contain enough bits. Um, well, I'll, I'll get back to it. So there's some other reasons why you would want to have a chip in your passport. Um, it's much, it's sort of, you can put some extra data in there. You can put a higher quality photo than you would have optically, okay? Um, so 450 by 600 pixels is good enough to do facial uh, biometry. So you can do face recognition if you have, I'm, I'm not an expert at, at face recognition, but if you have something like 60 pixels between the eyes, then it's um, then it's good enough to, then it's reasonable. Um, at least, some, I mean, some governments trust that uh, at the airport uh, you can have a machine check whether someone is the real passport. Or That's all we have this now. Uh, yeah. Is there a reason why it is not f exactly 450 and 600? I have no idea. For okay. different countries, there are different um, sizes. Um, and basically, the face is either JPEG or JPEG 2000. And JPEG 2000 compresses a bit better. Um, but there's there's definitely a limit to the number of uh, kilobytes you can store in the chip. We're talking kilobytes, you know, not megabytes. Or, uh, <laughs> um, so, fingerprints. Um, are since 2009 uh, available in Dutch passports. They're actually protected by a different set of keys. So you can't use just the optical access key. For it. <coughs> you need to have a key, for an external PKI, um, to uh, to access those. So that basically means that the Dutch government has to give other governments uh, has to sign their keys, has to sign their certificates to give them access to your fingerprints. So if you go to Belgium uh, and they are able to check your fingerprints, that's because the Dutch government has decided to trust Belgium, and not, not because of some capability that the Belgians have. Um, the signature that I was talking about in the previous slide is only two kilobytes, so that could fit nicely in, in a QR code. But um, it's, it's this extra space that you have that allows you to do to include better biometrics than the optical picture in your passport and that would allow a machine to do the comparison. Okay. So that's another reason why a chip is good. Plus. So if I travel to Brussels for example and I uh, for <coughs> some reason I want to get in an office in a government building. Maybe Belgium, Belgium is, a, is not a good example because you don't have to show your passport of course. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> France or yeah. whatever. <coughs> but uh, then when they chip when they check my fingerprint, they have somehow an online connection to a fingerprint database in the Dutch, in the Netherlands, or...? No, no, they will have a certificate, a 
and they will show that certificate to your passport and your passport gets to decide whether it trusts that certificate. So this will be signed by the Dutch government and then your passport will judge it and say, okay, this is signed by a root, a private key that I know it belongs to the Dutch government. So to say it like this, my passport, my fiscal passport, gives permission to, <coughs> to the guy who is checking yeah. my uh, passport. Okay. Yeah, but I think what you're also asking, the fingerprint is in the passport. Not, it, it is not in the passport. It is oh, it in is. The passport. oh, it is in the passport, yeah. So yeah. 35 kilobytes for two fingerprints, actually. Yeah. Um, they're inside the passport. Now, in, in the Netherlands, there was uh, some discussion about having also a database. I mean, if you ask all Dutch people to hand over their fingerprints when they um, uh, get their passport, you might as well store them in a central database as well, which mm -hmm. is good for the police, so they can search this, uh, this database. And at this point, the politics has decided not to do this, so they withdrew this uh, proposal. <coughs> so I think it's a good idea. So your fingerprint is in the passport, passport, but is it being uh, 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 is it being read or being written when when you are in the foreign country? It, it's being read and compared to the live capture of the fingerprint that you give there. I have to also say, at this point, no one is doing this because the, the underlying PKI, the, uh, the distribution of keys to make this happen, is not at a state where you can do this. So if you go through the automatic border control at Schiphol, it will scan your face and compare it to the well, sort of only protected by the machine readable zone and uh, picture of your face. So fingerprints are being collected now. I think by 2015, all countries in this scheme will have to uh, do this. Uh, we did it in 2009 in the Netherlands. Uh, we scratched, uh, so we, we don't, uh, the, the database was not a good idea. I mean, we couldn't, the general public didn't like it. So politics I'm not sure they did, though. <laughs> well, if you, yeah, they, I, I think they're in the process of actually deleting them, but the proposal to do this. And I'm not sure. They promised to do that. <laughs> True. And that was a politic promise. And they are, maybe they are working on it. But it's, it's actually a good point. They were never centrally uploaded. But I think that many. Um, well, the central database is scratched, as far as I know. Yeah. It's still local. Uh, and I think the, uh, the local um, towns and cities um, might have. Which is actually worse than having a central database. Okay. Camera here, so I have to do that. <laughs> the, this picture is also pretty nice. I found it on the internet. This was a demo at the Konoduk Marshall Sein, apparently. If you look at the screenshot, where they had the uh, Minister of um, Defense uh, uh, show his passport, also including machine readable zone and all details. <laughs> search for that on the internet. Um, so a third reason would be this automatic border control that I, uh, that I talked about. Um, um, airports are seeing that, um, that uh, many, uh, there, there are much more travelers. It's not exponential growth, but at least it's, the number of passengers is growing, of course, and uh, border control guards are expensive. So they are looking for ways to make the queues smaller and processing of passengers faster. And since you can do biometric comparison using your face, um, they've been piloted, piloting this, this and I, I think they're here to stay. Um, so you could say this is sort of like trivium, if you know trivium, but, but for you know, the poor people, but you don't have to become a